you. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, this has been a lot of fun uh, doing these things. Um, we, uh, um, we're, we all here from the Arboretum hope that everybody is staying um, healthy and safe and uh, doing what they can to keep things, uh, keep things looking good uh, uh, for everybody else. Um, got a couple things. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Got a couple things I want to mention before I get started. All right. So this is going to be a fun one. A few of my favorite things. We're going to, we'll, we'll get a couple of, um, go through a couple things for it, for you. Um, I don't know. There was a possibility that uh, the university was going to make us change the address we used for um, these Zoom recordings. I don't know if that's actually uh, going to be the case or not, but um, it might be worth uh, uh, copying down this link because this link will work no matter what the, the even if they change the, the web address for this Zoom meeting. So it's just our normal uh, uh, address, jcra.ncsu.edu, and then slash or backslash midweek, and then another slash. So if you copy that down, you can get us for all of these that we do every, every Wednesday. Another thing I want to mention, uh, we have a class that's coming up starting next week, Chris. Yes, it's starting next week on Tuesday. We're hosting it on Tuesday and Thursday evenings for three weeks in a row at 6.30 p.m. for two hours each. So um, if you don't know uh, Brie Author, uh, you should. She's fantastic, um, extremely knowledgeable. She's written two books, The Foodscape Revolution and Gardening with Grains. Um, she speaks all over the country, but she's local here. She lives down in, um, what, Fuquay, Apex, or somewhere. Um, and she's going to do a six-part class, three weeks, uh, Tuesday and Thursday evenings. And she's going to talk about, you know, how you grow food when you have deer. Um, how you deal with them, you know, things in the garden that do and don't work, how to improve your soil, how to have harvest, you know, all year round, um, you know, how to, how to garden where you don't really have space, you know, containers and things you can do on balconies and, um, and you know, the, the backyards of, of small townhouses. And um, one of the things that she's really done a lot with is not, um, exiling your your food plants to their own area but but mixing them in with uh all your other plants to really make a beautiful garden so it's um kind of really uh, blurring the space between uh the flower beds and the vegetable garden beds so uh really you, you should you should uh if you're you even considering being a vegetable gardener, uh, you should really think about uh, signing up for this class. Uh, I know it's going to be it's going to be pretty amazing. And Bree has really been putting in a lot of work to make sure that this um, this really works out well for everybody as an online um, thing. So really strongly encourage you to look into that. And a couple things to add, Mark, if I can. The Please. meetings are the meetings are recorded, so you will have opportunities to review the recordings for additional information. And if you just can't join us that night as well, you can uh, just uh, join us as a um, video watcher. Yeah. And just so everybody knows, if people have watched these Midweek with Mark videos um, that we record, these recordings of Bree's class will be available to people who are signed up for the class, not the general public. Um, the next thing I want to mention is the Southeastern Plant Symposium at home. Uh, we are not going to have a two-day event like we had planned um, back a year ago, uh, but we are going to have uh, on June 12th, that's a Friday, uh, we are going to have um, a Southeastern Plant Symposium at home. We've got a, uh, a fantastic lineup of speakers. 
uh, who are all really excited about this. Uh, Dan Hinckley is going to be one. Um, he's still trying to figure out what he wants to talk about, but I think he may walk around his home garden and use that to talk about the plants and, you know, the stories behind them, both his own personal stories, collecting them, but also um, stories of, of uh, other collectors and, um, you know, kind of the history of, of the plants and in, in, in the wild. So it should be fantastic. Nick Maser, whose name you may not know, but should, he owns one of the best nurseries um, anywhere. Uh, it's in the UK. It's actually, it's the coolest place to visit because it's in this um, like walled courtyard of a castle there. It's, it's really wild. Um, but he travels all over collecting plants. Um, and has, uh, he blows me away every time I go visit him. Uh, our own Tony Avent, um, I'm gonna be talking about his crevice garden, I believe. Uh, John Cho, who was with the University of Hawaii, uh, he was the person that Tony Avent worked with um, in developing the Royal Hawaiian Calacasia series, uh, which is kind of interesting. John Cho was uh, a pathologist who was breeding plants to, um, breeding elephant ears to uh, to be um, disease resistant uh, for edible ones and um, Tony convinced them to to start uh, breeding these um, ornamental uh, elephant ears so the white lava and uh, Maui coffee cups or I, I can't remember the names of them all but um, all those that have kind of a tropical or, or a Hawaiian um, name come from John Cho. Uh, Kelly and Sue Dodson, who are a couple that own Far Reaches Farm uh, and Far Reaches Botanical Conservancy out in Washington uh, State, Port Townsend. They, uh, phenomenal nursery. Um, I, I always miss their order because ordering time because it's right in the middle of spring when I'm so busy um, and in the fall when I'm busy, but uh, I, I got my order in this year. I've got some really cool stuff. There's a couple things from them that I'll show in this actual talk that have already become my favorites. And then finally, Jimmy Turner, who is the brand new executive director of Red Butte Botanic Garden, the um, uni uh, uh, University of Utah um, Botanic Garden. But he has just returned. He was at the Dallas uh, Botanic Garden. He just returned from uh, Sydney Botanic Garden, where he was um, director of horticulture uh, for quite a few years, and he's going to talk a bit about some Australian plants that we ought to at least think about trying in the southeastern U.S. Um, he said he can't guarantee that they'll that they will do, but they're ones that he think he thinks might be um, might be good for us. So that should be very very interesting. Uh, so really hope um, some of y'all want to join us. Um, the, the, it's going to be $50 to get six speakers. Um, it, I think it is one of the, the best deals around um, that you're going to find. And man, I'm excited about this because these are speakers that we've wanted to have in. But usually we can only have one of these in because otherwise it's just, too expensive to have fly people from the UK and the West Coast and um, Utah and, and Hawaii. So we really have gone um, far afield to, to bring in all these people. So hope y'all will consider joining us. Uh, I don't think registration is quite open yet, but should be opening pretty soon. And what time was, will that be? From It'll when be to when? 10 to 3. 10 to 3, thanks. All right, enough of that. Let's get into my favorite plants, a few of them. I have a lot of things that I, I love out in the garden and it, you know, it changes by season. But, but I started with one that um, is, uh, those of you who've been on tours with me and listened to talks, and this may be one of the few that I have talked about in these Wednesday, Wednesday talks. Most of what I've put in, I've tried to put in different things than, than plants I've talked about already. Um, but uh, this uh, may be my favorite plant, the one plant that I would not garden without 
is osmanthus fragrance. And I'm pretty partial to the, the orange flowered form, variety Orantiacus. Um, they're used all over Asia. Uh, they're in bloom every year when I'm traveling there, you know, usually I'm there in October. And the smell of, of osmanthus fragrance really uh, it, it puts me in, in the mindset of, of China. Um, I really do. I, when I smell it, it uh, brings to mind um, the hotel where I often stay when I am finishing up my trip to, trips to China. It's a little hotel that's connected to the Shanghai Botanic Garden. And all around it, there are osmanthus um, growing. And the hotel has a deal with the Botanic Garden. So I can go from the hotel and go through a back gate into the Botanic Garden for free. Uh, so it's, it's, I'm always walk through there and I love what they do in Asia. And this picture of the full plant is one that was taken at a nursery in China, uh, last time I was there and they love to grow osmanthus as trees. They grow them as single trunked plants with these rounded heads. Um, usually we grow them multi-stemmed. Uh, I need to get some young plants and plant them out and just keep them to single stem because I'd love to have that in my garden at home. Um, they have a little more patience growing the plants in, in China than we do here. The one downside to the orange flowered form is it tends to be, the, the flower period tends to be shorter than the, the white flowered one. Um, and I'm not sure why that is, but I think the orange uh, flowered ones uh, usually have a better form than the white ones, especially as young plants. So I do love that. Um, I've got several of these planted at my house. My favorite one, I didn't have a good picture of it, is one called Apricot Echo. It's a really vigorous form. It flowers multiple times. Um, it just kind of keeps, that's why it's called Echo, because it keeps those, those apricot orange flowers coming. So it, it does it multiple times during the season. And the new growth on it is especially nice. It's a really dark um, burgundy on the new growth, but it tries to keep growing. So even when it gets cold, it tries to keep growing. And every year the tips of it um, get killed off in the fall, but that's okay because it doesn't hurt the plant. It actually keeps it, it's like you're, you know, trimming the tips of it to keep, get it fuller um, every year. So it actually works out pretty nice. Um, this is the one I may have shown previously. This is a new one that we um, have helped to introduce. Uh, we brought in from another, from a, a nursery in, um, in China, uh, Osmanthus fragrance Quianan Guife. Uh, we're working to get this in cultivation. We've got a nursery who's really propagating this as fast as they can. So we hope we're gonna have this out soon. Uh, Quianan is the, the region in um, in China where the, it's a nursery region, a lot of nurseries there, and Guifei is one of the five legendary uh, beauties of, of China. And the new growth comes out bright red and then fades to white and then green. Um, and you can see this is, this is a plant at my house. Many of these pictures are gonna be taken at my house. Um, this is a young plant that, so it's kind of thin. What I'm gonna do this year is after it finishes all the color show from, from uh, the new growth, I'm gonna trim it back so I can get it a little bit denser, but I also wanna see if I'll get any of the color um, emerging when we get you know, in the hot part of the summer. You, often these plants, you really only get this color when it's cool in the spring, um, but it it's provides a show for an extended period. I haven't yet seen it in flower, but I'm sure it's going to be a white flower uh, in the fall. Um, but I'm, I just absolutely am in love with this plant. Um, I think once I get it really dense, it's just going to be like this cone of pink in the, you know, early spring, then go into white with pink tips and then solid green um, during the bulk of the summer. Love this. Another one at the same time that we brought in is this one, Yingbi. Yinbi Sheng Shuang Hui, which I do not know what it means. Um, if anybody speaks uh, Chinese, please um, let me know what that means. 
Uh, but you can see that in the spring, you can see this color, it comes out um, uh, flushed pink in the spring. So it's variegated. So the green part in the center looks dark burgundy, whereas the white part um, has a real nice pink. And then after that, it'll go to just this um, irregular white edge on a, a regular kind of leaf shape uh, on there. We brought in two variegated forms, but this Yinbi Shuangqi seems to be the better uh, performer of the two. So this is the one that we're really gonna um, push for um, into production. And I'm sure when we get it into production, we'll pr it'll probably get some, uh, some trade name on there to sell it a little bit better. So, you know, it'll, I don't know what it'll be, but you know, it it'll have some other name that, that people ask for, but the cultivars will still be these Chinese names. Now, one thing I always like, uh, you know, when I'm reading stuff about JC or things that he wrote or talked about, and I know that a lot, he talked a lot and, and pushed a lot of vines. And I love vines. I, I absolutely adore uh, vines. They're, they're just amazing in the garden. Um, I grow a lot of, of clematis or clematis, uh, if you prefer. Um, and uh, I grow a lot of smaller ones, um, and, and I like the, the smaller flowered forms. Uh, this clematis, which comes from, um, out of, has Texensis in its, in its, uh, heritage and its parentage, it's called Happy Diana, and it's growing, this is again at my house, and this is growing on a, um, Empress of China, evergreen dogwood. I was really hoping that the flowers would, they would open at the same time, but um, the, the Empress of China is a little bit later. It's only just barely starting to, to open up. But it grow, I grow this through the tree. Um, and you know, so right now, this is, this is happening right now out in the garden. I've got these little cups of uh, really thick textured bright pink flowers on a, on a tree that otherwise isn't showing much now. Um, as this finishes up, the, the dogwood starts up, so I'll get the great white flowers on the dogwood, and then it'll be green over the, over the um, uh, you know, rest of the summer. Um, and then I'll, I cut this, um, this clematis back uh, in about halfway uh, during the winter and then let it scramble on through again. I think I love, I wait until my trees and shrubs get large enough that I can plant a, a clematis on them um, or some other vine. Uh, you know, you just have to pair the right vigor of vine with the plant that it's growing on. Um, I grow several asparagus uh, species, like asparagus, asparagoides um, through, uh, through my trees as well. Um, this, uh, another little clematis, Zoprica, and this is one I cut all the way back to the ground, um, but this is it. Picture taken yesterday, uh, just like the other one. Um, this is growing on uh, one of uh, NC State uh, uh, Professor Tom Ranney's uh, plants. It's growing through a calicarpa called Purple Glam. So the calicarpa won't do its show until a little bit later, but the new growth on that calicarpa is, or beautyberry, is um, real purple. Um, I didn't get a good shot showing the, the purpley new growth alongside this uh, Princess Kate uh, clematis, but again, it's one of the smaller flowered ones um, that I just think is, is real, real special um, and looks great growing through that, that other shrub and doesn't bother my other plant at all. This is a picture not taken yesterday. This was taken last year because this is the seed head from a clematis. And I always show this to show that once the clematis finished, they still have another finished flowering. They're still beautiful in fruit. And I have this one growing through a Tokyo Tower um, Chinese fringe tree, Kyanthus retusus, Tokyo Tower. This one has, um, uh, 
yellow flowers, real super thick textured that are beautiful, but then the, the seed heads are every bit as pretty as, um, as the flowers are. Uh, so I have my, my Tokyo Tower flowers in early in the spring. It's just finishing up now. I'll get the clematis flowers um, really more towards uh, mid-June or so. And then I'll get the seed heads um, you know, July, August, September. Uh, so I really get this, you know, I've extended the season of my, my Tokyo Tower uh, Cayenanthus. I have three of those planted and I have this on one of them. I have asparagus, asparagoides on another one. And I have the yellow flowered climbing bleeding heart, Dicentra uh, or Macrocapnos been given a new genus but I can't remember what that is growing on the, the other one so um, and as my trees get bigger I will probably replace some of those vines which are smaller vines I'll move them over to smaller plants and plant a vine that's a little more vigorous and is going to grow a little bit taller and that the tree can handle just love love vines plant put them on every single plant um, there are other ones this is a Schisandra, I think it's Schisandra chinensis uh, that we collected in Gansu in 2018. Schisandra is sometimes called um, a magnolia vine because the fruit clusters look kind of like the, the red seeds from a magnolia, but they're also super, super primitive uh, plants like, um, like magnolias are. Uh, in fact, the earliest record of a flowering, fossil record of a flowering plant that sh has the, the uh, fruit um, still, you know, in the fossil really looks a lot like Schisandra fruit, which, which makes me think this has got to be one of the, the earliest, earliest things. This form, we, we, in 2018, we saw this and thought, wow, that is really nice. Collected seed and hoped we would get something that would be as nice, and it is. Um, it's an evergreen vine. Typically, Schisandra need a male and a female. Uh, we don't know, if, you know, with our seedlings what they are yet, um, and we just have a couple of plants. Um, hopefully we have one of each, or if not, hopefully one of the other schisandras we grow will pollinate it. But I've got one of these planted at my house. I've got a woodland um, around my house. And so on the, the larger trees in there that, that I'll be leaving, um, you know, some of the pines and oaks that, that I'll leave in there as I'm, as I'm doing more, more and more gardening in that area. It's a, I've only been in the house for a few years. So I haven't really gotten in there as much. I, but, I, but something like this, I, I've got one of these planted out in my house on a, a big pine tree um, because that can that can handle it as it as it gets grows and gets larger. Um, and I do that with other trees. I've got um, I've got probably as many vines as anything else growing in my garden, and and I've always got room for another vine to grow up a tree. Now. Another plant that I was pleased to see that, that JC really liked um, is Ardesia japonica. Um, Ardesia japonica is uh, a Japanese plant. Um, one of kind of the neat things about it, um, you know, I learned it as this green plant and where I first really fell in love with it was it was planted under a, uh, evergreen oak, a Japanese evergreen oak, in an area that it got basically no light because this oak shade was so dense. I know it never got watered and it was just a dense, dense ground cover in that shady area. And you know, people are always looking for ground covers, especially for shade. Now this is at the Arboretum. Um, I don't currently have any just plain green leaf Ardesia japonica. And this is actually um, Andre, the, Andre the Giant. This is a large leaf um, Ardesia japonica. But it's a little woody plant in the, the uh, Mercinaceae, Mercinaceae family. Um, but what, there are so many of them. This is what I really love is there are all these variegated and odd ones uh, that come out of Japan. 
Um, there's this one, Hukan, uh, or Hukan, which is, um, Hukan in Japanese is kind of the male, what you would call the male equivalent of a geisha, um, but some, but somebody who's more an entertainer, singer, dancer, that kind of thing. Also, you can kind of translate it to jester. That's kind of where it, where it falls. And the Japanese have so many of these ardesias because um, there's this, uh, the way of growing plants in Japan called koten enge, uh, which is where they grow plants in these um, very special little clay pots. And there are several groups of plants that they're especially noted for that. Ardesias, uh, hepaticas, the, the liverworts, um, uh, dendrovium, a certain um, orchid, where they grow all kinds of variegated ones of those. Um, there are some lady palms and um, just, just a whole bunch of these, these plants. And there'll be magazines dedicated to them and shows dedicated to them. So, while you can grow these in little containers, uh, we tend to, I, we can grow them outside. And in a cold winter, sometimes the tops will be burned back to the ground, but otherwise it's evergreen. It's a little pinkish white flower under the foliage and then a red berry. So a few of them that are in the trade that you can find here are this Hokan and Itofukuren. Ito, Itofukuren really just means it's, it's a white edged design um, to the plant. Um, so you get this white edge over the silvery leaf. Um, man, that is gorgeous in a, uh, in a, uh, a woodland. Um, <clears throat> this is one that's sold here as White King, Hakua. Uh, this is at Duke Gardens, and I love the way they have this just in a, a pot like this. I'm definitely stealing this idea um, from my house. I'm going to put it you know, in a pot in my woodland like this. I love that. Love it, love it, love it. Um, and all of those are fairly readily available in the trade. Um, I'm going to move to some that are not so available, but I still love. I love all of these. I want every single one of them. Um, this uh, you can maybe find, uh, Murayama Senego. Uh, Murayama means Mount Maru. Uh, and Sonego kind of means silver dusted. So you can see this, the new growth coming out has this um, silvery look that, that slowly goes to green as it ages. So it's kind of the, you know, snow dusting on Mount Maru. Uh, it, this has been a really vigorous one, very nice. I'm, I'm really pleased with it. Uh, it's, it's a gorgeous thing. Kokan, look at this. This has got a red edge to it. Now, some of these I have not been growing long. We just got in um, 30 plus new cultivars from Japan. Uh, so uh, the ones I'm showing you are ones that I am growing at my house, uh, but we'll also be evaluating them here at the Arboretum and hopefully making them available uh, more widely um, soon. So Koukan means Corona. So you can see it's got kind of this Corona around the um, around the leaf that's red, and I don't even know. We just got these these this um, uh, winter. We don't know if that red is going to stay red all summer long, or if that's just new growth. But looking forward to seeing that. And another one, Kayoku, um, which means like celebration or ceremony, and it's got these very uh, cut and uh, irregular margins, but with a white stripe down the center and some pink in there. Um, wow, can't wait to see what that one does. And Koshinohana, now this is interesting. This is why I like getting in all these plants because this one looks a lot like Murayama Sonego. Is it the same thing? I don't know, we'll grow them, um, you know, so we can evaluate them, but it has that same look. Koshinohara, um, hana means something kind of like bed of flowers. Um, not exactly, but that's the closest I can get a translation to that. But all of these will, over time, will form dense, dense mats of, of foliage. Obviously, the variegated ones uh, tend to grow a little bit slower. 
um, but there'll be just these, um, it will spread by underground stolons, um, not nearly as quickly as I'd like. The tops will grow depending on the, the variety from four to eight inches tall. Uh, and like I said, little, little pinkish white flowers and red fruits that are kind of under the foliage, but the red fruits um, do show up a bit. But until you get down to really cold temperatures, they, they're evergreen out in, in the woodland and in shade. And once they're established, they're incredibly drought tolerant as well. I just love all of these ardesias. They really are a favorite. I, I withheld from going into the other ardesias that are not quite as, as um, cold tolerant, like ardesia crenatas and some of those that I love and crispa and that kind of thing. Um, I do have a few that, um, Myonishki, uh, this is at my house, and this is what I think Myonishki is supposed to be, which is, uh, translates kind of as brocaded, beautiful child. Um, but this is coming off of it, so I'm not sure what to expect with this. Uh, you know, it may be too white, uh, too much, too little chlorophyll to live on its own, but if it has a broad, um, margin with that in there, that could be something it, interesting. Um, we'll, we'll just wait and see. Uh, uh, we'll, as this grows and spreads, we'll, we'll propagate that piece and um, see if it retains that characteristic. Um, not, just not sure at this point if it will or not. Um, but yeah, there's, and, and ardesias are fine. They're tropical, shrubby, big ardesias that um, sometimes you'll see down uh, uh, in Florida and places. Um, and and um, there are you know, shrubby ones that kind of people use as, as houseplants. I learned ardesia crenata as a houseplant. Um, these take well to pot culture, so you can do them like coton inge and grow them in a container or grow them in the ground. Um, another one, Hanate. Look at this weird thing. I mean, it's got like these little green growths almost on the leaves, but then it's all kinds of different colors. Um, these really weird ones, I love to watch and see as they grow, um, and uh, they just keep every leaf is different, which I love. Now, I said I wasn't going to do a lot of other ardesias, um, but uh, Ardesia primulifolia. This is one that I had wanted for years and years. I had uh, seen this in the um, floor of China, and I know this is not a very good picture, but it was taken on a slope that was about seven degrees away from being vertical in the rain with people behind me and people ahead of me moving off and um, it was just this past year um, and we only saw one plant but I've wanted this Ardesia primulifolia it's got these fuzzy dark almost burgundy green leaves that lay flat on the ground uh, and then it puts a flower spike up above the foliage usually it's flowering the Ardesia's flower below the foliage and then it has the fruits on there so we've collected, we collected some fruit on there. It's the only plant we saw. I'm so excited to see this. I have not grown this in a garden ever before. So um, I'm hoping we get them to germinate. I hope we get them to grow. And I hope it gets to become one of my favorite plants. But it was, it was one of my favorite things to see in the wild for sure. Now another group of plants that I love, love, love are the deciduous azaleas. I will admit, I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, a lot of the evergreen azaleas. I like, I like them in general if I see them somewhere, but I don't need to grow a bunch of the southern indica and um, uh, other um, satsuma uh, type uh, uh, of evergreen azaleas, but the deciduous ones, man, I am all on board for those. Um, and I will say, I like the ones that are rich, deep, saturated, bright colors. Um, 
a lot of the Romy hybrids, which were um, from, from down uh, in uh, Alabama, we have a whole collection of Aromi hybrids, have a bunch of them in the lath house and planted out other areas. And a lot of them are soft pastel pinks and pinks with yellow striping. And they're all beautiful. But for me, if I'm gonna plant it, I want one that screams when it flowers. This is a great one, Temple's Joy, that's got these um, uh, really kind of corally apricot colors. Uh, King's Red, this is one in my garden at home uh, that I, I got at a, a local garden center here. Um, really rich orange red. Uh, I love it. Cayenne Capers, look at that. That gold yellow with orange highlights. Mm, I love these. And I love like these also because most of them are fairly upright plants. And so they're great for growing vines on as well. The, the other, the flowers really show up in summer. Now on these, I always grow deciduous vines or vines that I cut back to the ground because I don't want anything interfering with that um, floral display in the spring. And, uh, you know, it, it really, and if you look at some of the species um, deciduous azaleas, uh, rhododendron prunifolium, um, that's, that's a native one, the plum leaf azalea, that flowers in July, August in some form. So you can really um, extend the bloom, but I like them when there's no leaves on the plant and it's really just these, these round trusses of flowers um, at the tops of them. Another one, Queen's Rose. Look how just rich and saturated that is. Pinks and that touch of yellow orange in the, the one petal. Lemonade, just solid yellow. This one's kind of a late one, so you often have foliage with it, um, but I can live with that, I suppose. But I really, I really like these. And I grow them everywhere from full sun um, into, you know, pretty heavy shade. Uh, growing them in full sun, the foliage sometimes looks a little bit rough by the end of the season. Um, but man, the flowers are spectacular. Uh, but this is a group that I'll just keep adding more and more and more different ones into my garden, um, as many as I, as I can. Strawberry Sunday. This is to getting to be almost too pastel for me. I want it to scream, but still pretty good there. Um, especially those dark buds that open to, to pink. Now I do love evergreen uh, rhododendron as well. They're all, azaleas and rhododendron are all in the same genus of rhododendron. But um, we, you know, kind of in, in common names distinguish azaleas from rhododendrons. And I love the, the yak rhodes. Um, uh, they tend to be smaller uh, than um, some of the other evergreen rhododendrons like uh, the Fortunii hybrids and things like that. Um, you know, in most of the ones that you see sold um, around here even still are ones that were bred for extreme cold tolerance. If I see another rhododendron uh, Nova Zembla being sold at a garden center, I'm gonna pull my hair out. Nova Zembla, if you don't know where that is, that is like up in the, uh, an island in the Arctic Circle uh, above, uh, Russia and, you know, the Scandinavian countries there. That was bred for cold tolerance, not heat tolerance. And so many people tell me you can't grow rhododendrons in our area. Um, but that's because they've been using the, trying these ones that were bred in the South. So you got to get the species, the ones that, either the species that are from warmer areas or plants that were bred with some of these heat tolerant species. They're much more root rot resistant, they take our high nighttime temperatures, they do well. And so the rhododendron yakushimanum or rhododendron digronianum subspecies yakushimanum are, are great for that. This is just the straight, um, well, straight subspecies of digronianum. Um, you see the pink buds that open to, to um, almost white flowers. Uh, but what's, for me, even better than the flowers, I mean, those flowers are pretty darn nice. But the new growth on the foliage, 
And these are two different forms. These are both Yakshimanum. Uh, this is one that comes out with a more rusty silvery. Uh, this is one that the newest of the new growth comes out rusty, but then it goes kind of the silvery on there before that finally falls off. This is also formed with more rounded um, kind of uh, uh, incurved leaves. Uh, but that, I love that. I just think that's spectacular. Somebody needs to come in there and take out these old spent flowers in there though. That's, um, they do need to do that. Um, you used to be able to find some of these yaks like Yaku Princess and Yaku Prince and other ones. They are so hard to find. Even mail order, I have a hard time finding them. If you see these for sale anywhere, let me know. And I'm being serious about that. Let me know. I will make a road trip to the, whatever nursery it is and uh, I, will, I will buy as many as I can because um, I just absolutely, absolutely love them. Um, if you're somewhere too far away for me to reasonably make a, a, a day trip to get them, just go ahead and buy them for me. One of each type they have and bring them and I'll, I'll, I'll pay you back. Um, but I do, I just, they're, they're amazing. Another great species that we uh, grew for a long time here is this rhododendron mackinoy. And these can be kind of difficult to find. Uh, they're, they're not too bad from seed, but trying to grow them from cuttings is tough. This particular species, you, you stick the cuttings and they just sit there and sit there and sit there and don't do anything. And you know, you pull them out and you check, well, it's not doing anything, you put it back in. I finally found out, but put out one thin little root and every time you pull it out to check to see if it's rooting, um, you break that root off and you just have to like sit them, put them into root and then forget about them for about a year. Um, but I love the foliage on this one. It's another one that comes out kind of covered in this silvery dust. Um, it has this real dense uh, indumentum on the back and then these nice uh, pink leaves. I love these. Uh, there are some other species that are, that are heat tolerant. Um, there's a, a series out of um, the Southern Living Collection that, are, that have uh, some of these heat tolerant um, species in them. Uh, they're called the Southgate series. The foliage just isn't quite as nice as what I'd like from the species, because that's, that's what I really like it for. This is another one I would grow for the foliage alone, and I didn't have a good shot of its new foliage, um, but, but I would grow it if, even if it never had a flower. There are other ones out there. Um, this is a kind of, I'm sorry about the quality of this picture. This is kind of a bad picture taken on my cell phone yesterday, I think, while I was moving too fast. This is one called Vulcan's Flame. Uh, it, it looks a lot like one called Rhododendron Vulcan, but it's a, a more heat tolerant form of Vulcan. Has, uh, this picture doesn't do it justice. It has as close to pure red as you're going to get in a, a, a rhododendron that we can grow in this area. Um, this is one that's from uh, a cross between a species Griersoniana and a cultivar called Mars, which isn't super heat tolerant. Um, and you get this plant and it stays low. They kind of make these low mounds and then just, you know, you can barely see the foliage because of the, the flowers. But if you peek, you can see a little bit of the foliage coming up through here, the new growth just starting as the flowers are going downhill. So you can see it comes out covered in these almost silvery white uh, uh, scales, which will fall off um, as, they, as they fully open and um, become dark green. And the backsides of the leaves are still um, fuzzy on there as well. Just love these things. Oh my. Man, uh, the, what we call the woodland lilies, um, the polygonatums and disporums and disporopsises and mayanthemums and uvularias, you name it, I love it. Uh, this is one called tiger stripes, I'm using a picture from the arboretum because it's better than, um, than mine. Uh, we got this from Japan uh, with the name Uma. Decoro, um, which you can kind of see still on that label, um, which basically just means, you know, striped yellow polygonatum or something like that. 
So it was given the name Tiger Stripes. Um, but look at that, this is a vigorous plant, grows in the shade, uh, spreads, has nice little white flowers. Um, and they don't all have to be variegated. I'm gonna show you several variegated ones. This is a, a species, Tessellatum, Polygonatum Tessellatum, uh, which grows in southern China, Guangxi, um, western Yunnan. Uh, it grows into Myanmar and Thailand as well. So a lot of the forms are not hardy. This was taken at my house and you can see the blasted hutinia behind it, the bane of my gardening life. Um, but this is it in coming out in the spring with this coppery color. And this form always has this, this coppery color, I'm, I'm told by Dan Hinckley, who collected it. Um, and then it goes solid green. By this time of year, it's, it's um, solid green. It's little white flowers uh, dangling from it. But these polygonatums, they're so varied. I have some polygonatums that grow at my house uh, that I didn't take any pictures of because they're too small. They only grow um, about three inches tall and they're thin little things and, and you can barely see them and I got to make sure I don't um, I don't lose where they are because um, it'd be so easy to plant something else on them and then there are ones with um, you know stalks that are almost uh, three quarters of an inch around that shoot up um, to, to seven or eight feet um, with with leaves that will kind of cling on to other plants and so this is a really um, broad group, and there's it's great. There's a there's an expert on them, um, Aaron Floden at the uh, Missouri Botanic Garden, who will actually you know he's he's a nice guy and will actually answer your questions about what is this species? What you know? I send him pictures of the foliage and the flowers and the roots, and he'll send us back you know oh man this looks like it's a new species. It's a uh, you know related to this send me a piece when you can it's it's great having people who will help you out but the japanese love them as well and do a lot of variegated ones uh this is one called uh zen set to uh, polygonatum lazy anthem zen set to i don't know what that translates to i haven't been growing it long enough to figure that out but it's you can see it's got this kind of white ribbing down the center of each leaf um that's very cool this may be my favorite polygonatum of all. Uh, this is one I collected in Taiwan in 2014. It's polygonatum arisonensi, which I love. Um, I grow both variety formosanum and variety arisonensi. But all these limbs, they have, they're very dark, almost purple. They go up and they arch right over. The leaves have almost a, a silver veining on them. And then these clusters of white, um, flowers uh, tipped with green and then that's followed by um, blue ba black fruits. Uh, it is just to me a an absolutely spectacular plant. A lot of the polygonatums they don't flower very heavily um, or you can't see the flowers very well. This the way the leaves kind of arch up over the uh, you know go kind of at 45 degree angles up like little wings and then the flowers hang down and the way the stems arch just perfectly you get to see all of these flowers and it always flowers this heavily i just love it um my goal is in my home garden that's where this is to collect all the fruits this year um, from my polygonatums and sow them uh, here at the arboretum so we can distribute some of these fantastic species um, an, a one that is, is pretty widely available, usually as uh, Diasporum flavins or Diasporum flavum. Uh, it's been moved into Diasporum, to Diasporum uniflorum, uh, but it has these rich yellow flowers, almost like a uvularia. Um, and these are kind of all at the ends of the, the stem, mostly at the end of the stem. So as it comes out of the ground, by the time it's four inches tall, you can see the yellow flowers peeking out and it keeps kind of expanding up, becoming a stem, the leaves unfurling and the flowers coming down. Um, mine's already finished flowering right now, um, but it, it'll stay with that, that really nice clean green um, as, it, as it continues. And this one's a, a good clumper that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and slowly 
moves out, but um, but vigorously enough that every year your stems will, you know, your number of stems will will double or triple. It's it's really really a good plant. If it's happy, it just goes and goes. Love that. And these are all really um, shade garden plants, although you can stretch some of them out to more sun. Not, not the variegated ones, but some of the species. Uh, this is another um, Hinkley collection um, of Dysporum brachystemon, which grows in, in um, kind of uh, southern uh, China. Uh, this one, um, you can see it's kind of branched, unlike some other ones. It grows upright about 24 inches, but then has these purple flowers, and they're pretty large um, flowers. They're about an inch and a half. Um, really showy both, and it's great from a textural perspective as well as from um, for the flowers. Um, yeah, I, I just think it's it's an amazing one. Another in this group of woodland lilies are the Dysporum. Uh, this is one Dysporum smilocinum Kino Sukasa. Uh, and you can see the foliage. This has kind of these yellowy uh, chartreuse tips to the, the flower, the leaves. Looks like the, the tips have been painted. This is um, a recent picture. And you can see the flowers are pretty large compared to the plants. Um, this one only grows about four inches tall for me, but it is a great spreader. It'll, it'll really do something. So you got those chartreuse tips to the leaf. Then you have Rejo, which has been much slower so far, which has kind of the, the white paintbrush tips. And this is another one that's only about four inches tall. I'm hoping this will grow a little bit faster um, as it settles in. Uh, you know, the, the, this one just took off immediately. This one I'm hoping is following, you know, the first year it, it sleeps, the second year it, it creeps, and the third year it leaps. If so, next year it should be beautiful. Um, but it's kind of neat with that. I love that how the, the variegation works on there on those tips. And when that gets to be a whole patch like that, but with that really white on there, um, it's going to be something else. Um, this is a, a different species, uh, the Sporum Cecily variety minus. And this is the form Shiroshima Nakafu, which is a chartreuse leaf with the the green on the tip, uh, kind of the opposite of the last one. Um, these are new plants, so um, it's one of my favorite plants right now. If it doesn't grow well for me, it might not stay one of my favorite plants, but if it grows really well, and Dysporum sessile usually grows very well, sessile means that there's no um, uh, uh, uh Petiole, who is losing the word, the, no leaf stalk, no petiole right there. It's just attached. But if this is vigorous, then I will have plants to divide and bring to the arboretum. And, um, you know, we'll be able to grow them out and hopefully share um, the arboretum. And this Dysporum sessile, sessile is usually one that really does bulk up very well. We'll see with this one. It's a lot of, there's not a lot of green on there, so it may be very slow. All right, as of today, and I say that as of today, other than that Polygonatum aracinense, perhaps my favorite woodland lily is this one that I got uh, from, actually from Kelly and Sue Dodson, who are gonna be uh, speakers at our June um, 12th uh, uh, Southeastern Plant Symposium, is this Dysporopsis Jinfushanensis. Uh, Jinfushan is a mountain in China. So this is a Dysporopsis from Jinfu Mountain. Dysporopsis are evergreen um, forms of, of these woodland lilies. Uh, so evergreen uh, uh, forms of, of Dysporum polygonatum kind of things. This one is only about well, last year I would have said it was only two inches. Now it's gotten up to maybe four inches tall. Um, it's just these glossy green leaves. Didn't have a problem through, through the winter at all, and it shouldn't from high elevation. Jin Fushan has relatively large flowers. You can see a flower there, but it has doubled in size in um, uh, since July 
for, I think last year, yeah, July 4th last year when, when I got the plant. It doubled in size in the garden. I've kind of got it between stepping stones and grow about four inches tall. Um, this is one I'm definitely going to be able to share with, um, with the Arboretum um, uh, real soon. And so we can get this going and, and again, hopefully get it out to people. My sprops is Jinfu Shanensis. I think it's just almost perfect. So I've gone from a bunch of plants that are both, you know, mostly green leafed things without, um, you know, real showy flowers in most cases with those Disporums and polygonatums uh, to something that's that's pretty um, can be pretty gaudy, and those are peonies. And I never thought I would be a peony person. Um, I can appreciate them; they've got huge flowers. Uh, they're long lived, uh, but I'd seen so many peonies that the flowers disappeared so quickly because of the heat; they would just fall apart or they would flop you know so many of the peonies you get this great big flower on and then boom, it rain and they're all laying on the ground um, so I really like peonies that stay upright and don't flop like that and I don't think I really appreciated species peonies enough until I came here and started working at the Arboretum and we have a patch of these uh, uh, peony lactiflora uh, which has these white to pink, single to semi-double flowers. Um, dies back to the ground in the winter, but then flowers for a long period of time in early April. And, um, I mean, excuse me, late April into early May. And they are just so perfect to me. I, I think they're gorgeous. Um, they last for a long time. They don't lay down flat on the ground when it rains. Um, and so that got me interested in species peonies. And so I've been starting to uh, collect and grow species peonies to see which ones um, really do well um, for us here, uh, which ones will grow. I do this a lot of times with my own money at my own house before investing in some of these expensive plants for the Arboretum. So, um, you know, I do this. Uh, one I'd always been told is very difficult for us to grow um, is, is Peonia Mlocosavicii, which is known affectionately as Molly the Witch, uh, because nobody can remember how to say Mlocosavicii, so Molly the Witch. Um, it has these creamy white, almost yellow flowers uh, with this uh, red down in the center and this this um, halo of, of yellow stamens over what I think is really pretty foliage as well. Um, I've always been told this is this is really tough plant. It's been very easy for me to grow, uh, and I'm I am I am a lazy lazy gardener. Um, so I planted this as a very young plant with only one leaf. And that may be the key to growing some of these species that have a, a reputation for being difficult is to plant them very, very young. Um, my plant had one leaf that was about three inches tall and uh, it's, it's done fine. Uh, this is a flower on it from this year or last year. Um, I'm hoping this year I'll get some seed in it on it. Um, I didn't have other peonies really blooming at the same time. So I should get more seedling. If, if I get good seed, I'll be able to share that. So, uh, we'll be able to grow it out here and, and hopefully share it. Um, Mucosavicii, uh, really nice. This one takes a can take a little bit of shade. I have it in full sun, but it can take a little bit of shade. Um, um, Peonia caucasica, um, and I should mention Laskovicii comes from kind of the Azerbaijan kind of region, and there's a lot of peonies out there. Um, caucasica, kind of same thing from the Caucasus Mountains. Um, this is another one that I love the foliage on. When it comes out, it's got the, the back sides as it's coming up are kind of um, bluish, and then the top side's kind of this nice... Um, I don't know. I don't know what color you call that green, but it's pretty, especially with the blue backsides. 
Flowers are very showy on it. The flowers go over pretty quick if it's hot, but I'm okay with that. Um, the, the ephemeral nature of some of these things, I actually, yeah, you know, it makes you appreciate them a little bit more. Um, I do think I'm gonna have good seed on this one. Uh, so I'm definitely hoping to collect that and grow that here, um, grow that out here at the Arboretum. But a beautiful little thing, and this is another one I grew from one little, um, one little leaf uh, of a seedling, and it's done very, very well for me. Um, there are a couple of, of Japanese, Asian, uh, really shade-loving uh, peonies. Um, they'll grow in, in more sun, but they really like uh, a part shade um, garden. Um, Peonia obovata and japonica are, are the two that you most often see. And the nice thing about both of them, um, that you can get, obovata is white, japonica is pink, although there is a white form. And when you get the white form of japonica, it can get be very difficult to tell if it's obovata or, or white japonica, but you can. But with both of them, what's nice about them is after they finish flowering, if you leave the seed heads on there, they'll, they'll float up and uh, they'll inflate into these kind of uh, light green um, horns and then they'll open up and kind of flip over and you get see the the dark blue black that's that's a seed the rest of these are seeds that didn't make it uh, you know aborted uh, fruits in there um, but they're all bright red so you get um, this kind of uh, fall late summer fall uh, show of bright red, because you always get a lot of these bright red ones in there amongst it. I mean, what could be better than that? I, I just, I don't know. I mean, that flower, that is mesmerizing. And then you get this as well. Two seasons of beauty. I just, I lose words. It's so amazing. Uh, another one with big showy flowers are the lilies. And again, I love, I love the species lilies. So this Lilium speciosum, this is from uh, southern Japan and in, in southern China. Um, I really like these kind of Turk's cap type lilies. These are my favorite ones. And all the named cultivars are fantastic. They really are. But there's something about the species that I just really like. So this speciosum, this is a one with a, a kind of a pale pink and then it's speckled. But if you get in there and look at those speckles, they're, they're actually like, um, uh, you know, little, uh, little protuberances that the closer you in, you get the longer they are. I don't know what the reasoning for that is. It's a lot of the lilies are like that. Um, and you know, all kinds of things pollinate them. You've got a wasp in there pollinating that one. Uh, you know, Sun is, is going to be best, but it'll take a little bit of shade. Um, some of these lilies are a little bit floppy, but all you need to do is plant them so that they kind of grow up and can lean on other perennials or uh, other shrubs. You know, it's usually not a problem for me because I plant so close in my home garden that everything has something else to, to lay on. And I just have to be careful that I don't swamp my plants. Lilium lectilinii. Uh, this is another one I got from Far Reaches Farm from Kelly and Sue Dodson who are gonna be talking with us. Um, this thing, uh, this comes from one area of Hanshu uh, in Japan. I didn't, I sh didn't get a great picture of it. Um, this will have, you know, upwards of 20 or 30 flowers on a single stalk. Uh, it's, it's pretty sturdy. Um, but look at that, that just gold with those um, burgundy purple spots. And it's just, it'll be tiers of whirls of flowers. And they'll open up kind of from the bottom first. You'll get, they'll start opening up and then the next layer and the next layer. And so you'll have a lot of it in flower at once. But then as the oldest ones fade, um, the younger ones will keep uh, opening up. William Lectilinii. Oh, man, I like that a lot. Lilium callosum, uh, this is one, it's almost, it's almost impossible to find in 
uh, in cultivation anywhere. This is a little short one, whereas um, speciosum can get, you know, four to five feet, maybe a little bit taller, and lectilinii can get six feet plus. Uh, Lilium callosum only grows to about 18 or 24 inches. Um, it, was, it was described, I don't know, what, 100 years ago, 100 years plus by um, Ernest uh, Henry, uh, where he found it in the um, St. Uh, Poe Gorges um, growing. And it grows on rocky areas and kind of will arch out. Typically only has um, one to maybe three or even five flowers kind of at the top of the, um, the stalk. Uh, we did not get good seed set um, either at my house or at the Arboretum. I, uh, I, sent, I had uh, people watching out for the, the seed on there. Um, mine at home looks like I'm going to have good flowering. It hasn't opened up yet, not even showing color yet. Um, but I'm going to um, do some pollinating on mine to, to make sure we get seed because uh, we couldn't have too many seedlings of this one. Um, it's just the cutest little thing. If you want to see it in the Arboretum while we're, when we are open again, probably won't get to see it in flower this year, but um, perhaps next year uh, it's on the, in our little miniature conifer rock garden uh, as you walk onto our, the rooftop uh, garden. So you can, you can look for it there. I want to hit some odds and ends. Um, this is one of two plants that has uh, ever really made me contemplate stealing a plant. And I'm ashamed to say seriously contemplate stealing a plant. I was at Longwood Gardens and they had the older, um, just uh, uh, Convalaria majalis. Uh, uh, I think it's just striata. This, um, with that has the striped leaves like this, but I remember looking around and thinking I could dig up a piece of this and nobody would know. I did not. And I, I had got straight at some point and it never got really good um, color. It was always kind of iffy in terms of the striping on there. Finally got Potsdam stripes, which is a really good one. Now I am not like some of these other plants. I'm not a a Condelaria lily of the valley um, nut. Uh, I do like lily of the valley um, just fine, but I'm not going to amass a huge collection of lily of the valley, I don't think, famous last words. Um, but this Potsdam stripes is just too good. This is it in my garden. Um, it's kind of tucked away in a back corner, and my wife loves it and, and um, she doesn't usually comment too much on plants. So I am going to dig a clump of this uh, this fall and move it around to um, up where she and I sit and have a cocktail in the evening so that it can be right where she can see it. Because if she's going to like a plant and talk about it, then I am going to encourage that uh, in her. So great. And, and Lily of the Valley are tough as nails. They will take abuse and dry shade like nobody's business. So once you get them go and they go and go. In fact, there's some people who don't like Lily of the Valley because they will spread and they'll form these dense mats and um, they can be hard to dig out once you really get them, get them going. But uh, I, I'll be okay if this one gets to be too big a patch. I, I could, I bet I could recruit some people to come dig some out for me. And the podophyllums, um, love-hate relationship with the podophyllums, these wonderful May, Asian may apples. You know, I, I like our may apple, but it goes dormant so early that, um, you know, it's, it's and, 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 and spreads so quickly that I just don't really give it the space to go in my garden. I'll enjoy them in the wild when I see them. But these Asian ones um, with these weird colors and odd shapes. So this is, the stem goes straight down from there. This is taken from right above if you're unfamiliar with these. Um, 
this is a new species for me. I hadn't grown it before, Podophyllum chingii. It came with the cultivar name Hunan, but I assume that just means it, it's this collection originated in, in Hunan. Uh, this is, some of these have been miffy, as the English say, and not so easy to grow. Uh, this one so far is seeming like it's going to be, it may be a winner for us. Um, it's taken the, the, the heat so far. It's taken the cold. Cold shouldn't really be a problem. I think the heat and humidity may be more so. So right now, this is one of my favorites. If it dies, maybe not so much, but these suckers are pricey. So, uh, and I've killed a lot of really great may apple, Asian may apple cultivars and hybrids and things. So I'm trying to find one that really performs well beyond the, um, the uh, versipoli and um, plantum. So one of the ones with, with really colorful foliage. And orchids, I do love terrestrial orchids. Um, the blatillas are the easiest ones. Um, when think, people think about orchids, they think about, you know, things that are uh, delicate and, um, you know, you got a pamper and whatever. But blatilla, the Japanese ground orchid, blatilla striata, is among the easiest plants uh, for the garden, and it multiplies so quickly. Uh, and the foliage is great. The foliage looks like um, like they look like they're seedling palm tree foliage when they come out. They're just pleated and fan-like, uh, really nice. They often come out early and you get burnt tips. You can see that this tip got burnt. Um, but usually we don't have a problem beyond, you know, these a little bit of burnt tips on them and I can live with that. Uh, I like them all. I grow a bunch of different ones, but this one ogon, which just means gold in Japanese, that has this chartreuse yellow foliage. Um, I really like that. It'll green up during the summer some, but in the spring, right now, when it's flowering and you have these, um, what color is that? Fuchsia, magenta uh, flowers against that chartreuse. Man, that is a hot combination. That is real bright, and I like that a lot. I am telling you. So, Latilla striata ogon, really like that. And we've uh, we've shared this around to get it into tissue culture. Um, so it is somewhat available um, out there. Our patches here are getting to the point where we might be able to divide some, um, and you know we could might be able to bring some back into the nursery and really push them um, and and get a whole bunch of them that we could uh, that we could distribute in some way. Okay, confession, I have not grown this plant. So this is one of my favorite plants that has I have never grown before. Um, I should have left the name off and asked people if they knew what it was because I saw this in the wild and I said, well, this must be an aspidistra, a cast iron plant. I don't know what else it can be. And then we saw an old flower stalk on there and we were like, by God, that's an orchid. And we found no seed of it. So uh, we can't bring orchids into the U.S. Um, we, did, we, we just don't carry the permits for it. So uh, we went, the next year we went back to China in kind of the same, we were in near the same area. And this was on our list to look for. And we found it with great big fat seed pods that we could take. Um, seed for orchids is a pain in the rear. Uh, you mostly use, do it like you do uh, tissue culture. So we send it off to some other people to do it in tissue culture for us because it just works better that way for us. And these are up and going um, with uh, uh, Peter Zale, who's a research breeder um, at uh, Longwood Gardens. I was supposed to get some of these plants for us until we were shut down this spring. Uh, but he's got a bunch, he's got about 
eight or so different orchid species that we've sent up to him to, to get back to us that should all be perfectly hardy for us. So while I've never grown this, this is already one of my favorite plants um, for the garden. I cannot wait to get my hands on it. Isn't that cool? That's an orchid leaf with, you know, yellow spots all over it. How, how just cool is that? I, I can't, can't get over it. Chromastra appendiculata. The flowers are not as showy as some orchids. We will, we will give it that, but still cool. Okay, another one of these odds and ends, um, Primula Dale Henderson. Hopefully some of you have grown this plant. Um, it's grown here at the Arboretum for a long time. So I first learned about this plant and first got this plant when I was living in Atlanta. And what I would do in the evenings, uh, in, excuse me, in the middle of the night when my infant son, who was born in Atlanta, was crying, um, and I was trying to get him back to sleep, I would sit in a rocking chair in his room and I would read the Heronswood catalog. Um, Heronswood, Dan Hinckley, who's coming, uh, who's gonna be speaking at our June 12th event as well. Um, I'd read his catalog and I came across this description of a primula, primula Dale Henderson. And he described it, you know, these uh, coral, ring around a, a gold throat of, of the best, one of the best performing primroses that he's ever grown. Uh, and even better, it grows great in the heat of the Southeast. Uh, he received this plant, this is all in his description, from Dale Henderson of um, Eastern Virginia. And I thought, well, I'm from Virginia. I want a heat tolerant primrose. So I ordered it because I felt like I had this connection to it and, and grew it and it was wonderful. And then went to work at the Norfolk Botanic Garden in Eastern, North, Eastern Virginia. And you know, a year or so after I start working there, I'm, I'm doing some stuff with the, uh, garden, the Virginia Beach Garden Club. And by gum, there's, I meet a woman named Dale Henderson. And I said, hey, I have a, prim, a primrose and she said, oh yeah, that's, I sent that to Dan. It's a great plant. And so I got to know um, Dale very well. Um, and she, she passed away and uh, you know, she, she left a little bit to the Norfolk Botanic Garden. And then when I got here to the Ralston Arboretum, I found out that, uh, Dale had left a, a pretty nice, a sizable gift um, to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum um, because she knew J.C. Um, to support internships. So uh, we have a Dale Henderson internship um, uh, a, a fund here that that helps fund one of our, one of our summer interns. And so I feel like um, I feel like I knew Dale before before I met her and then got to know her very well. And now I still get to revisit with her every year when we're hiring our interns. Uh, so I, I have this, uh, this long and special attachment to this. A, a lot of plants I have, I attach to specific people, you know, somebody who gave me the plant or somebody who was with me when we collected it or um, somebody who just loved the plant. And so I think of them. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice, this plant that brings back that memory of, of Dale, who was a wonderful person. All right. I am not a rose person. <laughs> Let me say that up front. Um, I don't spray things. I don't, so I don't want roses, but one rose that I love, and there are a few roses that I love, but one that I love is Rosa Glauca, the species rose, Rosa Glauca which has relatively small um, pink flowers, single pink flowers, um, you know, not the kind you're gonna wanna cut and bring indoors. But then it, but what I love about it is this foliage. It's got this, um, this silvery blue foliage that, that emerges kind of plum purple and then gets more and more silvery and it's not too big and you can keep it trimmed back. Um, 
it hadn't always been the best grower for me. Um, I've seen it in the West Coast where it's just phenomenal, but it's it's a plant that I have bought and killed multiple times, and I will continue to buy and kill it. And it wasn't. And I was putting this together and realizing, you know, I have not grown this in in a while, and now I'm uh, as soon as I have some time. So after we finish getting all the orders out for this plant sale. I'm going to be doing some some mail order uh, searching for Rosa Glauca um, because I really really want it again, and um, it's one that I I kind of connect with uh, the great uh, gardener and plants woman Janet Draper up at DC because I first saw this not in the Ripley garden that she maintains but but really close by to that. Um, and so I have this connection with her because I, I saw it uh, and then saw her. And so I, um, I, you know, I don't know. It used to be called Rosa rubrifolia, um, the red uh, leafed rose. But then it was, its name was changed to an older name, Rosa Glauca, which highlights the, the silvery blue glaucous foliage. And since it is glaucous, has kind of a bit of a waxy um, surface, it doesn't, it tends to not have as many pest problems. Of course, that's also because people tend to grow it by itself and not with a bunch of other um, roses, but I uh, love that. Another plant that uh, I fell in love with and just recently planted a nice sized one at my own house is Acca celloiana, pineapple guava. If you learned plants, uh, you know, 20 years or so ago, you would call it Feoja celloiana, but um, it's it's been Acca for a while. And this is it at the Arboretum. It makes these beautiful shrubs, um, which over time, um, you will become more and more tree-like. Uh, I've seen it, you know, used as a tree. Disney down in Florida uses it like that. Um, it's evergreen. Foliage is silvery blue. The foliage doesn't show up as, as blue in this photo as, as um, I would like. And this, the sun's kind of glaring on it, so it's hard to see, but um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, the foliage is beautiful. And, and except for a really cold winter, it'll usually do very well. We actually, this is actually one we call NCSU hardy because it's a little hardier than some other forms. So it has these, it's in the myrtle family. So it has kind of the, the myrtle-like flowers with the four petals um, and uh, uh, the central boss of stamens, excuse me, the um, four or five petals. And then the so central boss of stamens in there. And then following the fruit, the flowers, you get a fruit. It's kind of a, kind of like a large gooseberry looking thing. Uh, it's um, it's delicious, but we rarely uh, get it to ripen up here. It just needs a little bit longer season. It needs about another uh, month for those to ripen up um, so you can eat. But and I tell people this all the time. We always show our interns. These petals are thick and waxy, and they are delicious. Um, they're sweet. Uh, so not the whole flower, you just pop off the petal and eat that, and they are so tasty. And we always show our interns, and we'll come back after we've shown our interns, and a day or two later, there'll be a line as high as the tallest intern can reach, and all the flower petals below that have been taken off, um, you know, because, because they just can't help themselves. They keep, keep eating them, so there'll just be all those little bosses of stamens. Maybe that's why we're not getting fruit. Maybe uh, they're destroying the flowers too early. Um, but really cool plant. I love it. It's not often available because it um, it doesn't root very easily. Uh, you can root it, but if you stick 100 cuttings, you maybe get, you know, five or 10 to root. And those numbers uh, don't, the, the nursery industry doesn't love those those types of numbers. Oh, I should say, so the one I just planted is pretty good size. And so I planted it and right at the same time, I planted uh, a clematis um, that's, that's gonna have uh, uh, 
yellow flowers, kind of thick textured yellow flowers. So um, it's going to wind through that blue-green foliage and um, then have these uh, bright gold uh, flowers on there. I think it's going to look good. We'll see. Um, I finish up with with uh, you know a couple little oddballs. Um, sometimes a plant is one of my favorites, uh, not because I've grown it as a great and it's a great garden plant. This is a plant I have not grown um, in my own garden, but it's a plant that has been on my mind for a long, long time. Uh, in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. I was in China and I saw this tree, Litsia auriculata. And these, these were trees. They had trunks were 18 or 24 inches in diameter. Uh, I, you could, on the big trees, you could barely see the leaves on the, the bottom leaves. The trees were so tall, you know, you couldn't make out any detail on them. But on some of the younger plants, you could see that they were these great big, huge leaves. Um, Auriculata, for those interested, means eared, and that's what this refers to. This is called this auricles, um, or, or auriculate end. <clears throat> but it had these great big leaves. It was this tall tree, and it had this absolutely amazing bark, like a lace bark elm. <clears throat> and I it was not really a collecting trip that I was on <clears throat> and there wasn't any seed anyway. It was too early in the season. And I've talked about that tree for years after that. Uh, and, um, you know, I asked people about it. Do you know this tree? Do you know this tree? Oh, you should see it. It's got great bark. It's got great big leaves. It's, and nobody knew about it. And nobody ever heard of it. Nobody ever seen it. And it wasn't until uh, almost a decade later uh, that I was, um, I didn't have a trip to China planned for collecting, but I wanted to go. Uh, just I hadn't managed to, to put something together. And it just so happened that a friend, uh, Scott McMahon, who I've been collecting with many times, called me up and said, hey, are you going anywhere this fall collecting? And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about it. And he said, well, I was supposed to go to India, but my dog ate my passport the night before I was supposed to fly out. He's like, so I've got another passport now, but I you know, can't, couldn't go to India. You know, if you're going somewhere, let's, I'd like to go with you. And I said, like, all right. I was like, I don't have time for a long trip, but let's go to some pretty easy to get to places in, East, in Eastern China southeastern China and I was like there's one place in particular I want to go and there's one plant in particular I want to get so this is it in our nursery this spring Litsia auriculata Scott just planted one in the field we each have one plant um, so I'm just you know this is one of those ones that was so I wanted for so long that it's uh, I'm just excited that we're I'm finally have it and we'll be able to try and grow it and then this, I'll end here with this rhododendron. Uh, we're not sure of the species. I've never seen it flower. Collected it in 2014, so it's had plenty of time to flower. This is it in my garden. This is the new growth on it. This is the old growth. This is what it looked like all winter. It'll look more like this all summer. It gets even some brighter new growth on there. We're just waiting to see it flower but we're going to put a name on this and, and get it in cultivation. Um, one, and hopefully we can figure out the species, but it's a Taiwan species and man, it loves it here. It grows so well. I think this is maybe the best of the bunch, but we're still, we're looking at several of these um, the, out of this same batch that all have great foliage like this. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something pretty neat. I imagine it's going to have an orangey red flower, but I'm not certain of that. So it's very cool. Um, those things. And there are also things that I just don't know what they are. Um, this is a fern. I don't, I'm not a fern person, but 
this, this is, I, I don't, didn't get this back, back. We didn't have scores on it, but this is now going to be like that Litzia for me. These look like they were made out of metal um, just in the woodland. So I've got my eye peeled for that uh, now every time I go back to China. So this will, this will be my new uh, white whale in, in Asia to get this fern. And maybe I'll be able to figure out what it actually is before I, I get it. So just um, wanted to repeat some of these things from the beginning of the talk. Uh, the link, use this link uh, for future midweek with marks to just make sure you can get in. Um, sign up for Bree's class. Uh, it's going to be amazing. If you even have, are thinking about vegetable gardening, um, you'll want to be a part of this. And then our Southeastern Plant Symposium with Dan Hinckley and Nick Maser and Kelly and Sue Dodson and John Cho and Tony Avent, Jimmy Turner real who's who um, um, list. And I am happy to answer any questions that may have come up uh, that Chris didn't answer, couldn't answer, whatever. If y'all would like to ask them. Folks had a lot of questions about the availability or how to get the uh, deciduous azaleas early on. The deciduous azaleas, um, you know, one of the ones I showed, the King's Red, I got that at Piedmont Feed and Seed. Um, we were talking about him before the, the, the thing started. Uh, Chris Williamson had it there. Um, you can get them specialty mail orders sometimes. Uh, Rare Find Nursery is a good place um, that often has them. Um, but it, sometimes it can be, they can be hard to find. Uh, there is a local wholesale grower, and I'm not going to say who because he doesn't want retail customers, um, who is growing some, I believe he said, and he sells to a lot of the local places. Um, I actually saw several at Big Bloomers um, down in Sanford uh, just this year, so you may be able to go down there and get some. I can't remember which ones they had, uh, but you could try there. Don't forget, if you're an Arboretum member, you get a discount there. Um, other? Mary Ann just asked about where to find Ardesias. I'll where to find Ardesias. Uh, if, if you want different Ardesias, your best bet is going to be uh, Nurseries Caroliniana, probably. They're in um, North Augusta, South Carolina. They do mail order. Uh, they grow several of those, several of those that I've, I've shown you, uh, probably the only ones in the U S right now. Um, so it'll be a while before those are available and what we will do with those, we'll grow those until we can divide them. And then we will send divisions probably down to Ted Stevens at nurseries Caroliniana because he shares his, the love of Ardesia with me and he'll bulk them up into numbers for, um, to be able to sell. You can get, locally, you can often get Ardesia uh, japonica shiraman, which has a very small leaf and is a really good one. Um, sometimes you can get just straight Ardesia japonica, but usually shiraman is the one you can get. Uh, nurseries often have that. I've seen that a bunch of times at Homewood, uh, another place where you get a discount if you are an Arboretum member. Um, sometimes you can find uh, Hakuakan or, or used to be able to find Ido Fukurin, but I don't, I haven't seen that in a while. Other questions? You can also, uh, oh yeah, great. Somebody put the Nurseries Caroliniana um, website on, on there. It's N-U-R-C-A-R dot com. Uh, what does Ogon mean? Oh, Chris got that. So you've answered all these other ones, I guess. You answered a good number of them. Okay. We have a few people save them for later. I don't know if they're speaking up yet or not. Yeah. Um, you're welcome to, to ask it out loud if you can unmute yourself and or you can um, uh, or you can ask or you can do it in the chat. All right. How can I move your picture so that I can see the genus name for the next session? 
I think, I think, I don't know, but I will, I did notice that that was a problem. I tried to move the, my, my name. Um, so it was out of the way. I don't know if I managed to do that, but I, uh, I will be aware of that for next time and we'll make sure um, that that corner is open. I didn't realize, um, I didn't realize that would be an issue. This, I this love watching your handsome face, but I like to write those num names down too. I'm with you. I'm with you. The speaker window is movable. If you just wiggle your mouse over the window with Mark's um, video feed in it, a little bar will appear on the top of it and you can move it around. I'm on a iPhone. Oh, then I don't know that one. <laughs> it's probably stuck there. Yeah. Any other questions? I see a comment about the only place they've seen rhododendrons grow well in the Wilmington area is deep in the woods at, a, at Ashes Japanese Maple Nursery. Um, those deciduous azaleas, the, those rhododendrons, they're, they're breeding those with our native azaleas, which grow in the deep south and grow in coast. Um, so those are great. The other, the other rhododendrons I talked about are from, you know, hot, the species are from southern areas. Uh, Yakushima's uh, an island, an um, island mountain in, in southern Japan. It's a lot of that stuff from Yakushima does great for us. Um, I've heard people say that about rhododendrons. Um, I tell you, Norfolk Botanic Garden, which is a zone eight coastal garden um, in Virginia, very similar to, to Wilmington. Um, we had literally thousands and thousands of, uh, of rhododendron. The best way to grow rhododendron is to plant them small. Don't try, and, if you've got a choice between a three gallon plant and a one gallon plant, get the one gallon plant. If you've got a choice between a one gallon plant and a quart plant, get the quart plant. Don't plant it low because it doesn't like, you know, wet feet. Put it in, in a spot with moist, well-drained acidic soil. And um, unless you have, if you have ones that are adapted for warmer areas, they'll do fine. High shade. Speaking of uh, rhododendrons in general, I have a, a roseum. This is the second spring I've had it. It hasn't bloomed. Just sent up nice new growth in, of leaves. And then it's a, it's a reasonable sized plant now. It's about two and a half feet across and high. And I was just wondering, I had never heard what you said about uh, hot weather and heat tolerance and rhododendron. So I'm wondering if uh, that might be a cause of not, not blooming or getting any other thoughts. If you've got English rosium or rosium elegans, um, those are ones that I wouldn't recommend to get for this area. But if that's what you have and it's growing well, then it should flower. There, there's yeah. no reason for it not to flower. Uh, um, okay. It may not, just be uh, still not forgiving me for, you know, yeah. adopting it. I, I've got a rhododendron that, that's, you know, a, an evergreen broadleaf rhododendron that I collected in the wild. And every year it gets these round, fat round flower buds on there. And every year I'm like, it's going to flower. When is it going to flower? The new growth is coming. And then I go feel the bud and it's, it's dead. Um, ah. so, some, so that can happen with some, but it shouldn't with those. Those should be fine. The, the, uh, All right. Well, thank you. We'll keep our fingers crossed for next year. Yes. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, hope to see you maybe in Bree's class, because I'm going to probably be sitting in on some of those. And uh, hope to see you on June 12th, because I didn't mention, along with that, there's going to be an amazing plant auction with uh, the June 12th event. Are you going to do this next Wednesday? Yep. Okay. And, and until we're open back up, we're going to keep doing this, and I don't know what next Wednesday is. That's all we, right. I'll be here. We have the full <laughs> schedule listed online. I'll look it up in a moment. My computer has gone to sleep. And I send out reminders to our cuttings from the JCRA uh, email list on Monday before the lecture. Oh, I just so, thank you. Fine. 
This was Next supposed to be a short one. What? It has been, hasn't it? Th this one I thought was going to be a short one. I, I thought I was going to be finished with this one in 30 minutes. Whoops. I, I thought it was short too, but wow, you went, you went over big time. I did. Uh, wow. Next week is going global at the JCRA. Okay, great. Looking forward to it. Excellent. Breeze Thank class you for joining us. Breeze classes Thank start you. Tuesday at 6.30. Tuesday at 6.30, if you didn't hear that, for Breeze class. And that's that next week, this coming Tuesday? That yeah. If you're signed up for it, yeah, that's when you have to register for. And that's where do we register, please? At uh, uh, the Arboretum's website at jcra.ncsu.edu. Okay, thank you. Yep. And that's going to be a treat. You're going to be sad to come back to my Wednesday thing after seeing, uh, after doing it with Bray. Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you all, everybody. I, I do have to go. Um, so take it easy. Take care, Mark. It was a great talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I didn't thank sing. You. I thought about singing for y'all, but decided that I wouldn't be that cruel. <laughs> <laughs> I had a recording, Mark. <laughs> all right.